taking care of the organization. What's up, everybody? Pretty far show right here on a Wednesday of the WBUBA. Full show tonight, all night. Game four. Coleman of ESPN Radio is going to join us in 15 minutes. We'll stop from Tom Karen on both the Red Sox and the Bruins. Great win last night for the Bees. UVM basketball today going up against Middlebury College in the final exhibition tune of the year. So some of the Patriots as well. You can get in on the Napa Morrisville, Napa Waterbury text line. It's 802-585-3026. You are locally owned Napa stores in Waterbury and Morrisville. Again, that's 802-585-3026. Five, four, three, two. One. The opening thoughts of the Brady Parker Show are brought to you by Sticks and Stuff and by Swan Lumber, Vermont's most complete locally owned home center with locations in Edisburg, Derby, Middlesex, St. Albans, and at Swan Lumber. They're online at sixandstuff.com. I want to get to the Celtics a little bit before we talk to Brady Coleman. I got to tell you, I am playing for today. And I know nobody cares about my problems, but this is a relatable problem. I am playing hurt today. I sprained my ankle something terrible last night. I am in some real pain today. You all know I'm playing in this men's league basketball, uh, this men's hoops league in Essex, right? We play once a week. And yesterday was the start of the playoffs. So right after I got off the air, I booked it to Essex, got to the game. Second half starts, I, I rolled my ankle just Absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible. So Mike Triboli, the old UVM star, is on my team with me. He didn't do anything wrong, but he's got the ball. I'm behind him. We're breaking out in transition. He stops like he wants to stop and pop. And basically, I kept going and kind of ran into him and then twisted my ankle the classic way we all twist our ankles. Everybody's twisted their ankle before. If you ever played basketball or tennis or anything athletic, you've rolled your ankle. So this is not the first time I've rolled my ankle. This is probably not the worst time I've rolled my ankle. But damn, there is like, for so common and pedestrian an injury as a rolled ankle is, it is absolutely crippling while you're going through. I mean, our next game is next Thursday. I think I'll be able to play in that. But right now, today, I can barely walk. And, of course, bless the people at WDE. I love that this station's been around for 90 years. But there's like a zillion stairs to get from the first floor to the second floor. When you have a sprained ankle, I promise you, the last thing you want to do is be navigating the stairs in this building. And there's stairs everywhere. You walk in. You got to walk down. You, you, I want to put my lunch in the refrigerator, right? Walk in. There's too many stairs. Even that was tough. Then I got to go back up the stairs. Then there's three little wraparound staircases, and I'm playing hop along Farkas in order to get here. Oh, then you want to uh, to, to get to the bathroom. You've got some stairs to get back to the bathroom. You want to go get lunch. You got to go walk, walk down the stupid stairs again. Then you got to come back up. I've got an ice pack. It's got to go in the freezer. The freezer's downstairs too. So I've been up and down these stairs like seven times today. I don't even want to go down them once. Nevertheless, go down and then come back up seven times. I mean. Everybody's rolled an ankle. Again, it's a very common and pedestrian injury. It should not be this crippling. I mean, my foot right now, my ankle is like the size of a tennis ball. And now I have a normal sock on. Now my sock, like my ankle is so swollen that my sock, a normal sock, not a tight sock, 
it is now becoming a tight sock. And, like, the circulation is being cut off. I just looked at my ankle, and where the sock band is, the elastic, is now, like, it's, like, being cinched. I mean, this is where we're at right now. I'm playing hurt today. It, it, you know, my ability to press buttons is good, but my ability to walk from one studio to the other, not as good today. I mean, jammed fingers is another injury you get playing, you know, playing adult league sports. That one's pretty annoying. This is worse than that. I mean, my goodness. Bill and Cabot on the text line wants to know uh, if I finished the game yesterday. Uh, well, I, I kind of. Um, what's it all if I played through it? Second half is when this happened. Like 27 minutes left in the in the game, probably. And once it happened, I, I came off immediately. Probably sat for the next 10 to 12 minutes. Tried to walk around, couldn't jog anything. Came back on for about six minutes after that and really just kind of stood there because I needed to give somebody else a break. I pretty much just stood there, guarded the worst player on the other team, the guys who were way shorter than me, way older than me, and didn't shoot much, and just kind of kind of tried to be a roadblock. Uh, couldn't jump, only took one shot, missed it. Came back out, then sat for another four or five minutes, came back in with two and a half to play, and on one foot hit a couple of free throws to help ice the game. That, that was my contribution yesterday. It was hitting a couple of one-footed free throws. We did win the game. We will go on to the league semifinals. Hopefully I can play. I imagine that I will be able to. But uh, that's where we're at. Text lines, uh, Joe in Essex says, stop whining. No, I won't, Joe. People, it's called personality-driven radio. That's what it's called. And people like it. Okay, I got stats and figures out the wazoo for this game. We're about to get to that. But if I want to whine for three minutes about my ankle, then I'm going to whine for three minutes about my ankle. Virginia wants to know what I packed for lunch. Uh, oh, well, now the tech, now Joe says, just kidding. Okay, well, I still, personality-driven radio. Uh, what did I pack for lunch? Uh, homemade chicken soup, a turkey sandwich, and uh, some, like, combos. Delicious. I didn't pack it. Just made it for me. I was too, I was too hobbled to limp, limp around the uh, kitchen this morning. So uh, she did me a solid. Uh, all right, 802-585-3026. Freddie Coleman is going to come up in a couple of minutes. I want to get into more. I want to put more on the conversation about the Mayo We talked a lot about this yesterday. It is not official yet. The Nets have not officially hired Ime Odoka, but it still feels like a thing that's very much going to happen. And yesterday I was frustrated at the Celtics for their impending allowing it to happen. And we're now starting to get some answers as to why maybe they're just willing to let Ime Udoka go and coach one of their biggest rivals, right? I had said I want the Celtics to keep Ime Udoka on ice and away from Brooklyn. I wondered why they're going to let him coach there. Chris Mannix of uh, NBC Sports Boston with more. Anything else? But I've always believed the Celtics kind of just want this to be over, right? Like, they didn't hire Joe Missoula to be a stopgap coach for one year. They are hoping and have been hoping that Joe Mazzula distinguished himself enough to be the next long-term head coach of this team. They didn't make overtures to Jay Laranega, Brad Stevens' former assistant, to leave the Clippers and come in for one year. They were going to bring him in to be a fixture on the staff of Joe Mazzula. So Ime Odoka was never coming back as the head coach uh, in Boston. And I really do believe that at some point – over the next couple of months, if this Brooklyn situation not arisen, that we would have seen some kind of separation agreement between the Celtics and Ime Adoka that would have settled the contractual issues that, that remain. So Manic says the Celtics just want to be done with Adoka. And that's why they're willing to let him go coach one of their biggest rivals. And I got to tell you, I'm still not satisfied. I'm still not satisfied, and I'm still not happy. I get it. It would be easier to just let Ime Udoka go away. You put all the onus on the Nets. You make him their problem. It would be easier. You'd be absolved of any potential legal issues. I get all that. Yes, easier it would be. But you know what? Professional sports isn't easy. Professional sports is hard. And it's a business. 
And you sometimes have to do what is best for your business. And what is best for your business and your brand is trying to get the Boston Celtics the easiest path back to the NBA Finals. And putting a really good coach in your way is not that. So today, I am still bothered. Sometimes I'll be hot on something, and 24 hours later, I'll rethink it and and say, okay, I got a different angle or a different clarity, or I heard this. Not today. This is not one of those days. I'm still unhappy. I mean, look, how many times do players, how many times are players forced to stick out a situation they don't want to be in? The team doesn't want to move a guy. Why? They don't want him to come back and beat him. The team doesn't want to release a guy. The team doesn't want to give a guy a new contract. The team doesn't want to do that. Players all the time just have to sit there and take it and aren't allowed to start anew. I don't want Ime Udoka to be allowed to immediately start anew. All the time, players aren't given the chance to just up and go somewhere new. Ime Udoka, to me, doesn't need to be given that chance either. I remember when Le'Veon Bell wanted a new contract for the Steelers. He held out. He wanted a trade. Steelers said, good, sit out the entire season. He was forced to stick it out. Cam Akers of the Rams, he wanted to trade. Rams told him to stay home for a couple of weeks. They didn't trade him. Now they're trying to get it back with him. Brandon Cooks is all PO'd. He didn't get traded yesterday from the Houston Texans. Players have to grin and bear it all the time. Ime Odoka should have to grin and bear it too. Players who don't even do anything wrong aren't given a chance to go somewhere new. Ime Odoka did do something wrong. The Celtics should have kept Ime Odoka on ice. It's that simple. I'm not talking about doing anything illegal. Ime Udoka is under contract. Ime Udoka is being paid by the Celtics. His contract is being honored. They are not doing anything wrong if they keep him on ice. They should just let him enter the coaching market next offseason. Again, when Kyrie is was gone and Durant is a year old. I saw somebody tell me on Twitter, oh, you don't want to see Ime Udoka succeed. I, I don't care if Ime Udoka succeeds. Ime Udoka was my guy, and he screwed my organization, and he hurt people within my organization, allegedly. I don't care if he succeeds right away. I care if I succeed. I care about living in my organization to be comfortable at work. That's number one. And I care about my team to be And putting Ime Udoka of that is not a good decision. I mean, think about it. If the Celtics traded a bunch of really good players for them, would you be okay with it? Why would you trade your best elevator at this point. Actually, 
actually, I think we have an elephant. Elephant. Like, don't worry, I'm bringing it. I'll fix it. Yeah, I'll fix it. Yeah, I'll fix it.
I'm going to be in Foxborough on Sunday for Patriots and Colts, so I'm looking forward to that. See if the Pats can get uh, over 500 as they sit now at 4-4. Four four. I'm also excited because tonight is the final exhibition game for UVM men's basketball. They're taking on Division Three Middlebury College out of Vermont. Very good, very good Division Three program. I can't believe it's almost that time again. we got UVM hoops for real on Monday. Yeah, I know college basketball is no longer right around the corner. It's knocking on our door, and I can't wait to see in that conference because I think for my business challenge it's going to be fine just getting to be a very good conference because they're really good. That guy's graphic does a great job being a well coached basketball team. They got a couple of transfers coming in that are going to help them and three put one to get to six feet. Yeah. That helped that team get to the elite eight last year before they lost did not get a chance to go to the final four. And believe me, Brian's the kind of team that you will go to love to hate. And I can't wait for that first battle here real time with those two get together. Because they're pain and you know what. They're really good. They don't mind having the us versus the ball mentality. I can't predict really how that's gonna play out here one with Brian and Vermont being in the same time. Well pick one two in the preseason conference poll, UVM was picked number one. Brian uh, was just a few points behind. So it'll be a fun America East season for sure when we get started just after New Year's and Catamount Hoops against Brown. Uh, comes up on Monday night. Freddie Coleman, ESPN Radio, Freddie and Fitzsimmons. Tonight, we've got the World Series on. Freddie and Fitzsimmons is weeknight at 9 p.m. Freddie, appreciate you, and uh, I'll report to you uh, next week after my trip to Foxborough and how my ankles do. Yeah, I can't wait to hear that. Remember, I be hot. I be hot. I be hot. We can do it for next week. Yeah, I, I'm going to need something. Thank you very much, Freddie. I, uh, my, my ankle looks like it has. The, again, I had three ibuprofen earlier today before I came to work, so those are still in effect right now, so I'm not in as much pain as I was when I woke up or as I was when I was in bed last night. Hey, an ankle is no fun. I got somebody who's offering to bring me a cryo cuff, and I looked up what a cryo cuff is before I go to Freddie's answer. It is a uh, some kind of air cap or oh, wow. Okay. Uh, someone wants to bring me a cryo cuff. Someone wants to bring me a cryo cup. I'm not going to turn it down. It sounds expensive. I don't know that I'm worried. I don't know that I'm worthy of somebody's expensive piece of medical equipment. But if you if you think I am, if you want to help rehab my ankle, that would be much appreciated. 
Either that or uh, you can take my place to work tomorrow and do the show so I can come and walk upstairs. So, uh, either or. Expensive medical equipment or you can play radio host for a day. Some of you could probably do it. Ready to park a show right here on WDEV, AM and FM, WDEV Radio.com. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Ross says, Waterbury True Value has what you need to fix the elevator. If anybody does, they probably do. Mary and Randolph says, Ice and Elevate feel better. We'll be back to like soon. Look, here's the thing I'm most to be perfectly honest. Like, I want to play in the basketball game. and I will reveal their name and give them all the props. Maybe I'll even bring them on the show. Maybe I'll be on the show. Joe says you'll be much improved in three days. I'm certainly hoping so. Last time I sprained my ankle really bad, it took about it took about a week, week and a half for me to do things again because it was completely purple. That was worse than this time. This is bad, not as bad as that time. I want to recap some of what Freddie had to say. Freddie and I are in agreement on Mac Jones. Some other prominent Patriots insider isn't, and I don't get it. 96.1 WDEV FM Warren. 96.5 W243 AT Berry. 98.3 W252 CU Montpelier. AM550 WDEV Waterbury. This is CBS News on the Hour, sponsored by Dell Small Business. I'm Monica Ricks in New York. The Federal Reserve has increased its interest rate another three quarters of a percentage point for the fourth straight time this year. Fed Chair Jerome Powell. Financial conditions have tightened significantly in response to our policy actions, and we are seeing the effects on demand in the most interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy, such as housing. It will take time, however, for the full effects of monetary restraint to be realized. One more reduced hike is expected at the Fed's next meeting next month. Tonight, President Biden makes a last ditch effort to get more Democrats to the polls next week. Here's CBS's Stephen Portnoy. The Democratic Party event is taking place inside Union Station, the once vibrant transit and shopping hub a short walk from the Capitol. Due to crime and violence there, the station's lone Starbucks permanently closed this past summer. The storefronts are now largely vacant. The Democratic National Committee says the president's speech at the station will focus on the threats posed by election deniers and the stakes for democracy, as his party hopes to hold control of the House and Senate. A huge investment for Americans set to get hit with sky-high energy bills this winter. We are investing $300 million right here in Massachusetts and $13 billion nationwide to help families pay to upgrade their homes and to lower their monthly energy bills. Vice President Kamala Harris says households will get thousands in rebates and tax credits for things like energy saving appliances and insulation installations. In Florida, the Parkland school shooter has formally been sentenced to prison. The court imposes a life sentence with a 20 The judge's decision came after families of victims spent two days in that courtroom berating him as a monster. My hope is that you are miserable for the rest of your pathetic life. You are a hateful bigot. In a red jumpsuit, the 24-year-old showed no emotion as he was read the 17 consecutive life terms, as well as an additional 17 for those he wounded. 
CBS's Matt Piper. It's also been a tough day in Uvalde, Texas, where 911 calls were released. Can you tell the police to come to my room? I already told them to go to the room. We're trying to get someone to you. 21 people died in that rampage that went on for more than an hour. Tonight is the night. $1.2 billion is up for grabs in the Powerball drawing. If I win a billion dollars, I'm headed straight to buy a yacht in for the Bahamas. I told my wife I'm going to buy me a helicopter. She said, what you want to do with a helicopter? I said, well, I can go from this place to that place. What can't you do with a helicopter? Tonight's jackpot is the fourth largest in lottery history. The Dow lost more than 500 points today. The S&P slipped 96. This is CBS News. Dell Technologies Early Black Friday starts now with 48% off business PCs powered by 12th Gen Intel Core processors. Call 877-ASK-DELL. Why wait to save? Dell Technologies Black Friday event arrives early with select deals on top tech to power business productivity. The savings start now with up to 48% off performance business PCs powered by 12th Gen Intel Core processors. Don't forget special pricing on the latest monitors, docks, and accessories, including free shipping on everything. Call a Dell Technologies advisor at 877-ASK-DELL for Black Friday deals. That's 877-ASK-DELL. Guitar, here we go. Christian's travel agency has one right, goal. Talk to you soon. The world's biggest soccer tourney. The hotel is seven miles from the stadium. Are you serious? Did you email the transportation company? Now he needs an Arabic interpreter on his roster. I don't speak it either. Indeed can help him hire great people fast. I need Indeed. Indeed you do. You can schedule and conduct virtual interviews all from your employer dashboard. Visit indeed.com slash credit and get $75 towards your first sponsored job. Terms and conditions apply. A new study shows the landscape has changed dramatically since Roe v. Wade was overturned. The research finds one in three women of reproductive age in the U.S. now live over an hour away from the closest abortion clinic. It used to be less than a half hour before the Supreme Court overturned the landmark abortion decision. That's according to a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The research found a woman seeking an abortion now travels more than 100 minutes on average to reach a clinic. Wendy Gillette, CBS News. Families of those killed in the Uvalde school massacre marked the Day of the Dead today, or yesterday rather, with a rally outside the Texas Capitol. They even decorated an altar made of school desks covered in bright flowers and pictures. Protesters there wanted stronger gun laws and a higher minimum age requirement to buy assault-style weapons. Day of the Dead is typically celebrated by Mexicans to remember departed family members. Monica Ricks. CBS News. Think you know sports better than Brady does? Text in with your thoughts at 802-585-3026. Now it's back to the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV AM, FM, and WDEVradio.com. Welcome back in. Brady Farkas Show right here on WDEV AM and FM and WDEVradio.com. Thanks to Freddie Coleman for joining us. Freddie and I are in agreement on the Patriots and on Mac Jones. I watch Mac Jones play on Sunday, and I think the Patriots don't trust him, right? They they sat on the ball at the end of the first half were content to just run it and kick a field goal. They did next to nothing in the second half outside of the first drive. Like, Freddie and I are in agreement. The Patriots' play calling proved that they're not a big fan of Mac Jones right now. There's somebody who disagrees with us, though, and that somebody is Tom Curran of NBC Sports Boston. Tom Curran's very much in the know. We play his audio all the time. He's excellent with his Patriots coverage, but he thinks Sunday was a good day for Mac Jones overall. Huh? Yesterday's game told us that Mac Jones could settle down, knock a little bit of the rust off, and look better in the second half than he had in the first because I think people had very, very, very sweaty palms heading into halftime, penalty notwithstanding. It was enough to make you very concerned about the direction of the team. Second half, he quelled some of the nerves for everyone, I think. And that means moving forward, we can continue to gather data on whether or not he's a guy. The team, however, is extremely mediocre and will remain such. So Tom Curran says that Mac Jones played better in the second half? Do you agree with that? 802-585-3026? Because I'm, I'm in the Freddie Coleman camp. I'm in the... Sunday was not a pretty day for Mac Jones and didn't do anything to dissuade my my uneasiness. Tom Curran says second half was better. Do you feel that way? Because I don't. 802-585-3026. Look, the Patriots scored a touchdown in the second half. 
right? The first drive of the second half, Patriots scored a touchdown. That's great. But let's not act like that drive did a whole lot for Mac Jones to change my to change our opinions of him or to change our opinion of how the game was going. That that scoring drive was a six play drive that was aided by a 35 yard Ramondre Stevenson run on the very first play of the drive. So after the kickoff, one play gets the Patriots in scoring position. Let's not act like Mac carried them down the field. He threw a 13-yard pass, a 9-yard pass, and a 5-yard pass to Jacoby Myers for the touchdown. He didn't do a whole lot special. Like, it's a scripted series out of the half. You're supposed to do well on it. He gets the benefit of a big run, a couple of early down passes, which is when it's advantageous to throw. I'm glad they scored. That was all they did in the second half. Tom Curran's like, oh, Mac played better in the second half. Mac, his second half, you know, basically got rid of your your nerves. No, it didn't. He scored on a scripted drive, aided by a humongous run. And then after that scoring drive, you know what Mac Jones did? A drive that went 34 yards, a drive that went zero yards, a guard that a drive that went one yard, a drive that went four yards, a drive that went six yards, and a drive that went 17 yards. Where exactly am I supposed to be feeling a whole lot better? Yes, they scored a touchdown in the in the second half. That is great. And I am thrilled to death about it. But that said, if after that you go 34, 0, 1, 4, 6, and 17, where exactly is the special that's supposed to be making me feel a whole lot better? Because I'm not finding it. I am squarely with Freddie Cole. The play calling was mediocre. The play calling was conservative. Mac didn't do anything. I thought Mac played better in the first half, frankly. Like, he did have the bad pick six that wasn't. But I thought Mac played better in the first half. He ran for a few. He converted a few third downs. He stepped up in the pocket. He played with some poise and confidence, which I was worried about him not doing going into that game. I thought the first half was far more impressive than the second, if you're asking me honestly. Delivered a nice pass to Hunter Henry. I, 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 Tom Curran knows more Patriots football than I do. That, that is a given, right? And I'm not going to pretend like I know more than he does. But this one, I think he's very much in the wrong on. Mac was, I thought, dreadful in the second half. The scoring drive, he didn't do much. Fourth and one, he completed a touchdown pass. That is true. Well designed play, good receiver made a simple catch. It was a quick leak out to the flat. That, that that You and I could have completed that pass. You and I could have completed that pass. Curran also kept talking. This one is more, less inflammatory to me. So yesterday was the trade deadline, and the Patriots did nothing at the trade deadline, right? They didn't buy. They didn't sell. Why didn't they do anything? I don't know if it indicates a ton. To me, they don't know what they have in-house. They're trying to still figure out what this 2022 roster is all about and what it is going to look like in 2023. When you look at teams like Miami or teams like Buffalo, they have a pretty good idea who they are and where their holes are. I can't even identify where the holes on the Patriots are because they have yet to offensively grasp and identify. Uh, That I, that I, I believe Tom Curran is right. We are eight games in the Patriots, therefore, and the Patriots, don't really have an identity. And that is a problem. In the NFL, you need to have an identity. You need to be about something. And by eight games in, you should know what that something is. How many times have we said about the Patriots, they'll take September, the first four games, we'll figure things out, we'll kind of hit games, we'll try some things, and by October, they're going to be, they're going to know who they are. That doesn't seem to be the case this year. They're just kind of wallowing through the field. Are the Patriots a great team built on great defense? I don't think so. They have had great games defensively, right? Detroit is a great game defensively. Cleveland was a great game defensively. The Jets was a great game defensively. They got gouged by Chicago. They got gouged by Baltimore. They gave up big plays in the opener against Miami. So I don't think they are a great defensive team. I don't look at the Patriots and say defense is their total mark. I think it's very clear they're not a great offense. 
it's very clear that they are limited on that side of the ball. Eight weeks in, we don't know who they are. Buffalo, Philly, we know what makes those teams stick. Buffalo's going to play fast, and they are going to throw the ball all around the yard. Philly's a good rushing attack. Their quarterback can rush. They also take deep shots to A.J. Brown. We know what makes them tick. Seattle, we know what makes them tick. Tennessee, we know what makes them tick. Makes them tick. Cleveland, we know what makes them tick. The Patriots, we don't have a full idea yet. And, and this is what's frustrating. I like when my team has something that I can bank on. It's very, very cool. Right, to sit here and say, oh, the Patriots' identity is that they have no identity. It's very cool to say, well, they changed their game plan up based on the opponent. That's great. And it has worked for them a lot in the past. But I like to know that some of, that something about my team is a given. And right now, nothing about the Patriots is a given. And that is worrisome. And that is bothering me. And that is problematic. Right? Somewhere along the way, the Patriots made, made some mistakes. Last year, the Patriots had an identity. Did they not? It was very clear. Big offensive line, draft from Andre Stevenson, pair him with Damian Harris, smash mouth, run the football, our quarterback doesn't do a lot. That was last year's identity. And the Patriots chose not to run that identity back. Maybe that was the mistake. They traded Shaq Mason. Thought that was a problem then, I think it's a problem now. Even though they draft the gold trade, it's not Jack Mason, not a five, six, seven year veteran. So, you had an identity last year. You, you, you made moves that suggested you weren't going to run it back this year. You traded Mason, you drafted a speedy, thin wide receiver who doesn't fit back. You then decided you were going to change up your offense entirely. Okay. So, maybe the mistake was getting rid of last year's identity. And maybe the mistake was failing on your new identity so quickly. That's another thing I think you can look at and wonder if they did that. Mac Jones started four games, right? He started what? Opener against Miami, Pittsburgh. Week three was Baltimore. Right, there's got to be one other game in there, right? Got to be one other game in there. I have, to, I have to think about it here in a second. I think Mac Jones started four games. No, he had started. Uh, I think like he had started three games. He had started three games, and you were one and two, and Mac was turning the ball over a lot. And then Mac got hurt, and then you decided to go conservative with Zappy, and now you want to stay conservative with Mac. So you made all these moves to fit a new offense, right? Bring in Devontae Parker, draft Tyquan Court, get a smaller, more athletic lineman in full frame. You made moves to fit your new identity, and you failed on it after three Mac Jones starts. Somewhere here, you have made a mistake. You either should accept last year's identity and hold it back this year and made moves that fit back, or you go with the moves you made and you stick with what you did. I'm looking all around the league. And there are teams that struggle with what they wanted to do early. They stuck with it, and now they are good. I'll go right to my Seahawks. Are the Seahawks going to win the division? Probably not. They're a hell of a lot better than we thought they were going to be. Right? The Seahawks started out one and two. And what did, and what did they stay with on offense? Pete Carroll's tennis. I want to run the football, and I want to take deep shots down the field. And even though they were one and two, they decided to keep doing that. And now Geno Smith is a borderline MVP candidate. He's definitely the comeback player of the year as it sits. Kenneth Walker is carrying some of your fantasy teams, and, and they are gelling offensively. Tennessee started 0-2, has won five consecutive games, and Derrick Henry is back to being Derrick Henry. They, they stayed with it, and the Patriots failed. And the Patriots failed. Somewhere a mistake has been made that we're eight weeks into the season and we don't have an identity for this team yet. Last year's team had an identity. And I believe that last year's team was limited. I believe that being a run-first team like they are, like Cleveland is, like Seattle is, like Tennessee is, I believe there is a ceiling to that. We saw that ceiling in the playoff when the Patriots got killed. But at least they had an identity, and the identity worked for them. Either run that back or stick with your new decision, and you didn't do either. 
and you didn't do either. I have heard it for years. Texter, we will figure it out by Thanksgiving. Imagine a surgeon or an airline pilot saying, I will figure it out in 10 weeks. I, that has always bothered me also. Really, that Patriots attitude of, oh, we'll figure it out by Thanksgiving. Because here is what I believe. In the NFL, in professional sports, you can build a team of what you want, right? In high school, you just get given players, right? You have to adapt to what you have. So one year, you might see a high school football team that's round and pound. And the next year, you've got a great stud quarterback and a great wide out in that class. And now we're airing it all over the yard. In high school, you have to adapt to what you've been given. In the pros, you do not have to do that. You can have a belief system. You can have a core value system. And you can draft players that fit that. And the Patriots right now, I I don't know what... The the Patriots now feel like they are just collecting talent. Yeah, we'll collect talent, we'll figure it out. Some of these other teams, I think, are drafting, developing, and signing based on what their philosophy is. I look at the Seahawks, and the Seahawks got away from their philosophy for a long time. Right? Why have the Seahawks not been as good in the last six, seven years? Well, they paid Russ, the defense went to hell, and they stopped running the football. So the the Seahawks got away from their identity. What did they do this year? They let Russ go, and they got back to Seahawks football. They drafted two tackles in this draft, one in the first, one in the third round, I think. They drafted Kenneth Walker at running back. They brought back uh, Rashad Penny, and they've got their quarterback playing, you know, the stake-free football, but also taking deep shots. And their receivers fit that, too, with D.K. Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. Like, they are building their team in the image that they want, that they believe wins. And the Patriots don't seem to have that. They just seem to be collecting talent. And when you have just a collection of talent, it's tough trying to figure out how it's all going to work. Freddie Park and Shelton, WDEB, AM and FM, WDEBradio.com. All right, I want to transition over to... UVM basketball. The Catamounts, about 40 minutes from now, we're going to take the floor over at Patrick Jim, and they're going to play their final exhibition game of the year against Middlebury College. They're going to, UVM will open up the season on Monday. It's hard to believe. I ask you, 802-585-3026, how excited you are for Catamount basketball? Because I love talking to Catamount and it's interesting. When I post anything about Catamount on social media, it is by far the most shared, talked about, and reposted thing that I do. So the people are out there. They love Catamount. I'm curious how much you like the talk. Because if you don't, I won't do it. Frank. And how excited you are for the game. I think I'm going to go to the game on Monday after the show. Okay, show ends at 7. I'll get there for the second half. I think I'm going to go to the game on Monday. It's one of only three home games in the first semester for the Cats, so... I'd like to see them play because you don't have any chances for New Year's. So, UVM and Brown on Monday, UVM and Middlebury tonight. And I think a lot of people are going to roll their eyes at this game because it's against Middlebury and their D3 opponent. I want you to understand something. Middlebury is a great, great program. And I actually expect that Middlebury is going to play well in this scrimmage. I think Middlebury very possibly is better than St. Mike's who gave UVM a game. Middlebury went 18-6 and six last year. They're the best Division Three league in the country. They have a lot of players that could play D1 in that league. Head coach Jeff Brown, is he went to a Final Four. He's been to three Elite Eights in Division Three. It's a really good Middlebury program. So I think, I think this is going to be an interesting game, especially at the start. Especially at the start. There are a few things that I want to see in this matchup that I want to learn from this matchup. Can we get a little basketball music, people? Can we get a little basketball music? Uh, well, if we typed in the right thing, we uh, Okay, let's see if we have we got When we talk basketball, we got to this. Okay, there's a few things I want to see in this matchup. One, Aaron Deloney. He's the guy that we've been talking about for two days now. This is the guy I want to watch tonight. When I watch this game, when I go back and look at highlights of this game, Deloney is the player I'm going to focus on. 
I want to see how he focuses, how he follows his 26-point performance from Saturday night. Aaron Deloney has a huge opportunity to make major gains and major waves for this team. He has waited his turn. He's bided his time. He sat behind Ben Shungu. He was sixth man of the year last year. Yesterday, Tom Brennan told us he's going to be a star. So he's got the pedigree. He's been here in Burlington. He's waited his turn, and now he's got the hype. All that's left is to see Aaron Deloney back it up. Okay? We've got to see Aaron Deloney back it up because I've mentioned it the last couple of days. I've mentioned it the last couple of days. Players who have the ability to just go off offense like Deloney does, they tend to be inconsistent. They, they tend to be inconsistent. The great players, the best players in this league, UBS got six consecutive American East players of the year. The, those players, they had the ability to be steady. I want to see Aaron Deloney become that guy. I love the star quality that he has that Coach Brendan speaks of. I love the confidence that Aaron Deloney plays with. He knows he's good. He knows he's capable of what we saw Saturday night. I want to know if he's capable of just being a constant in that catamount rotation. He scored 26 the other day. That's special. Not everybody can go off for 26. 26 is a lot of points in a 40-minute game. That's a lot of points. Aaron Deloney can go off for 26. He can also, players like that, can also go for six, can go for four. Because if the outside shot is not falling, how do you respond? If you're not getting into the free throw line, where are your points coming from? It's hard to score that many points. In fact, I would love to see Deloney, but I don't need 26 tonight. I don't need 26 for the season. If he could get 15 a night, I'd be thrilled. And rather than 26 one night and one the next, I'd like to see 15 every night. That's what I want to see from Deloney. I want to know if he can be the constant. That's the thing I'm going to be watching tonight is how does Deloney play? How does he follow up the performance from Saturday night? Like, I'm going to look at Deloney's points last year. And I understand the situation is different, right? Shungu was here. Davis was here. He didn't need to score as much. I totally get that and understand it. But Deloney had games last year where he went off. Like, right, he had 18 against Colgate. The next game, he had five. Then he had 11 and 10. Then he had six, eight, five, nine, five. Then he had 24. Then it was nine, seven, four. Then it was 13. Then it was three. Then it was 20. Then it was nine. I, I just, I want to stop riding the wave. He's a very good player. He has the star quality. He's going to be huge to what they do. But I got to see the consistency. That's the only thing that's missing right now for me with him. And it's not even just him. It's players like him. They can fill it up on a, at, a, at a moment's notice, and they can also go cold or not get their shots in any specific game. Ben Shungu is going to get you 14 to 18 a night. Ryan Davis is going to get you 14 to 18 a night. Can Aaron Deloney be that guy for this team? 802-585-3026. Napa Forestville, Napa Waterford text line. Texter says, Brady, you should go to the game on Monday. Be prepared to walk up the seat. Uh, as long as uh, my ankle is healed, I don't care about walking up the seats. And as far as maybe I can sit on press row and sit right at, right at the front. Who knows? Well, I'll, I'll talk to some people there. Texter says, I'm headed to Patrick Jim now. Listen on the way up from Barry. The team needs to gel quickly for the tough early schedule. Should be a fun year. Yes, more Pats. I'm going to talk about the Cats a lot. I just want to know that you all appreciate it. we got a couple of yays in, uh, on that one. Another thing I'm going to be watching today is Sam Alamuzzi. This is a player that you haven't heard much about that I just can't quit being excited about. Last year, Sam Alamuzzi was a freshman, and he redshirted. We barely saw him. He had a lot of hype on the recruiting trail. We barely saw him. He's super athletic. When he was being recruited, I was told he was an NBA caliber player. That's right. Uh, I think what Vermont has here is a potential NBA prospect. I think he's the highest level prospect that that they'll see that they that they've got. That was Elias Sabaya last year with us on uh, 
That was actually in 2020. December of 2020, Elias Sabea on this show, he's a Canadian recruiting expert where Alamucci is from, saying that he's an NBA-type player. That, like, we didn't see that last year. I want to watch him tonight. Last week, John Becker, the head coach, told me that Alamucci is using that athleticism as a defender, as a rebounder, and he's starting to carve out a role. Well, he played just eight minutes in the opener and didn't attempt the shot. So I don't know. But I'm going to be watching tonight. Certainly athletic, the ability to defend, he can guard bigger players than some of his team will need. I want to see him have a role, and I want to see him play more today. If he, look, I'm okay if he doesn't score for this team. I am. Now, when I hear NBA prospect, I'm thinking, okay, he, oh, I'd love to see him get 20. But this year, as a redshirt freshman, I'm okay if he doesn't score. I was, I'm was i old enough to remember when Dre Wills was on this team a couple of years ago, was the defensive player of the year, and he didn't score more than probably six points a game, but he was on the court always. I'd be more than fine if Sam Alamutu does that this year. But you got to be on the court to be that guy. He played just eight minutes against St. Mike's. What does he do today? Number three, the thing that I'm going to watch for today, T.J. Hurley. This is the freshman that everyone's talking about. UVM is such a good program. It's such a veteran-laden team. It is hard. Okay? It is hard for freshmen who really have the chance to do it. Benny Shung, who had the red shirt. Alamut, who had the red shirt. Ryan Davis didn't really make an impact. It hasn't been to Anthony Lamb a bunch of years ago now that a freshman has really cracked the rotation and really strongly contributed. CJ Hurley is the guy who has a chance to do it. He's a knockdown shooter. Some publications are out there mentioning him as a person who watched nationally. He played 17 minutes the other day. So he certainly got the opportunity. He carried this team in, the, in one of the exhibition games over the summer in Montreal. He is the guy that you should be watching. Or if you watch today, if you watch Monday, that's absolutely a guy that you should be paying attention to. Like if TJ Hurley can score 7 8 a game, that's a huge win for this team. You don't get that from freshmen very often. Seven, eight points a game for TJ Hurley. I think he's going to play enough to get the opportunity to do it. you got to be watching for today. And speaking of scoring, I was thinking about this earlier today. I was thinking about what I want the scoring breakdown to be for this Catamounts team. Last year, UVM averaged 75 points a game. I think that's perfectly fair for me to want that again. So I'm going to go off that. 75 points per game. Here's how I want it to break down. I want Dylan Penn to be the leading scorer. I want him to get 16 points a game. Okay? I don't need 23. 16 points a game from Dylan Penn, I think, is more than fair for me to ask for and expect. Aaron Deloney, 14 points a game. I just told you 15, but when I do the math, I'll say 14 points a game. Again, I don't want it to be 28 one day and zero the next. I want him to be 11 one game and 17 the next. I want to be 12 and 16, 14 a game for Deloney. Finn Sullivan, my point guard, 13 a game. He had 17 in the exhibition open. He's got to be a guy who can score. He's a guy who can shoot. He's a guy who can get to the basket. He's going to have the ball in his hands a lot. He's got 13 a game. So Penn, 16, Deloney, 14, Ben Sullivan, 13. That's 43 points from those three players per night. That's what I expect. I'd like to see eight from Nick Fiorillo, my big guy, and seven from T.J. Hurley, the freshman who I just mentioned. That's another 15 points. So I just got 58 points per game from those five players. Penn was 16, Deloney, 14, Sullivan, 13. Fiorillo, 8. T.J. Hurley, 7. 58 points from those five. Can I find 17 points from the rest of the roster? That's what I'm looking for. That's the question that I'm asking. And I think I can. 75 points, I believe, per game is very doable for this team. Robin Duncan, Matt Verretto, Sam Alamutu, Cam Gibson, Perry Smith. Can I get 17 points from the rest of the roster? I believe that that is a fair ask. I'm asking for three players to get in double figures. Last year, UVM had just two, right? They had Davis and they had Shunku, and those were their guys. I'm looking for three and double figures this year. 
some contributions from Fiorillo and Hurley, and 17 points from the rest of the roster. The rest of the roster. Uh, Brady, awesome show. Yes to more UVM basketball talk. Maybe a few minutes on the ski team and hockey winning season. Look, we're, that's that's fair. I love Todd Woodcroft. And the reason why I didn't bring Todd Woodcroft on recently is because the team started out 0-4. Todd Woodcroft is one of the people who has been best to me since getting to WDEV. I think he is great for the UVM men's hockey program. And I do believe he is the guy, although it's a slow grind, I believe he is the guy to help bring the program back to prominence. They won a game last week, uh, two weekends ago. They split with Colgate over the weekend, so they're 2-0-1 in their last three games. It just might be time to get Todd Woodcroft on again. Now that they are winning again, you know, I I didn't want to bother them when they're losing. I didn't want to highlight the flaws of this team. I want to give them a chance to turn it around. UVM women, I think we've done a good job so far at highlighting them too. We had uh, Christina Shanahan on, one of their former players last week or two weeks ago, getting ready for the exhibition game as she's now playing for the Montreal Force. And uh, Jim Plumer, I'm sure, will be on soon because the UVM hockey team on the women's side is an absolute wagon this year so uh appreciate everybody's feedback and we will get some norwich uh stuff as well i know some people have asked for that frank durham the broadcaster george como some of the player we will we will get a norwich present We're, we do talk by the way to cam ellsworth the cadet men's hockey coach every thursday in the midday news service at twelve fifteen. so if you ever miss cam you can always find that interview i always post that even though it's in the midday news service on the Brady Parker Show podcast channel on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, WDEBradio.com. Texter says, with your ankle, Brady, when you go to the UVM game, maybe you can go to the handicapped uh, parking. I don't need that, but I will do my best uh, to sit on press route. That's what I'm going to look. I will, I'm excited by that opener because not only is it UVM basketball, not only is it a limited home game, TJ Sorrentine's coming back. We love we love TJ Sorrentine here in Catamount Country. He's the associate head coach at Brown, so it'll be good to have him back in the building. It's been a couple of years since he's been there. The show is brought to you in part by Pro Driver Training. Pro Driver Training, Vermont's premier truck driver training school online at ProDriverCDL.com. You can get your Class A, your Class B CDL, passenger and advanced skills training as well. Ime Odoka is going to get hired by the Brooklyn Nets. And sadly... This is just the latest example of something I have said for years. I'll tell you what that is next. Brady Parker Show and the Rise and shine with WTEV Sunday mornings. Begin the day at 6 with Joel Nasman and two hours of classical music followed by the takeout with Major Gary. A casual discussion of politics, policy, and pop culture. Then it's Jane Polly and CBS Sunday Morning with stories about the arts, music, nature, and entertainment. The morning concludes with Sunday morning swing time, an hour of swing tunes. Join us Sunday mornings on WDEV AM and FM and streaming at WDEVradio.com. It's been a great year for gardening, so enjoy your bounty all winter long. Come to the Willie's Store for candy and freezing supplies. See the Willie's Store for fresh seafood that now arrives every Thursday. There's quality meats, a huge wine selection, and craft beers, including Hill Farmstead Brewery. Look for newly arrived fall and winter clothing and footwear. And don't forget the true test interior and exterior paints and stains at the Willie's Store. Since 1900, Main Street across from Caspian Lake, Greensboro. I'm Phil Scott. We've been through a lot over the last few years, and you've seen firsthand how I lead, making tough decisions day in and day out, and being honest about why I make them. Yes, we have challenges ahead, but we also have opportunities. And with my experienced team, we'll continue to make progress, and we'll do it with integrity and civility, because that's what Vermonters deserve. I'm Phil Scott. And I'd appreciate your vote. Paid for by Phil Scott for Vermont. Dr. Travis Stork here to tell you about a great pain reliever called Salon Pass Pain Relieving Patches. Salon Pass is pain medicine in a patch. You stick it right on sore muscles for up to eight hours. Clinical research has shown that people that used Salon Pass reported less pain with improvement in mood, sleep, and the ability to work. Safe, effective relief is one peel in place away. Salon Pass, it's good medicine. 
Here's to Prilosec OTC. Without Prilosec, I wouldn't be able to enjoy all this yummy holiday food. Speaking of, whoever made that apple pie, delicious. Thank you. I just take one pill each morning and zero heartburn all day. So cheers to Prilosec OTC. Ooh, are those jalapeno poppers? Prilosec OTC prevents excess acid that can cause heartburn, so you can enjoy the holidays. One pill a day, 24 hours, zero heartburn. It's possible while taking Prilosec OTC. Use as directed for 14 days to treat frequent heartburn, not for immediate release. Hi, we're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that we can give our daughters everything they need to grow and learn. But not every child can focus on classes and play dates. Nearly 13 million kids in the U.S. face hunger. That's one in six. School lunch might be their only meal each day. And it's heartbreaking to imagine any child going to bed hungry. We're dreaming of a perfect day when kids can smile, play, and just be kids without worrying about where their next meal will come from. Feeding America is working to make that perfect day a reality. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste. That food is given to families and children in need. Being a kid should be about doing things that make an ordinary day extraordinary. Learning to play an instrument, building a sandcastle, hosting tea parties. Hunger should never be an obstacle to growing up. You can help end childhood hunger in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Hey, everybody, I'm Lee Cattell. Have your lunch with Brady Farkas and me weekdays on the Midday News Service. The latest local news, Brady's Sports Report, Roger Hill updates from the Forecast Center, plus business, interviews, and breaking news as it happens. The Midday News Service, weekdays during the noon hour on Vermont's news and sports leader, WDEV FM and AM. Stream to WDEVradio.com. Your chance to be part of the show is on the text line at 802-585-3026. This is Freddie Coleman of ESPN, and you're listening to Brady Farkas Show right here on WDEV and WDEVradio.com. Thank you very much, Freddie. Freddie Coleman was with us about an hour ago here on the Brady Farkas Show. The full interview is already up on our podcast channel on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and WDEVradio.com. Ime Odoka is not officially yet the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets. I believe that he is going to be. Sham Sharani has said it, and everybody else is saying it. So I believe it's going to happen. The Ime Odoka situation, unfortunately, is just the latest example of something I have said for years. How good you are at something dictates how big of a distraction you can be. How good you are at something dictates how big of a problem you can be. I have said this for years, and this will remain the case, and this will remain true until the very end of time. If you are great at something, if you are even very good at something, you can get away with things that other people can't. You will get chances that other people can't. You will get second chances that other people can't. This is something that will never change. It will never change in sports, and it will never change in life. We don't have to like it. We don't have to agree with it. We, most of us will never benefit from it, but it is just the way it is. Think about it like any relationship. You know this to be true. If you have an, a very attractive boyfriend or a very attractive girlfriend, they can get away with certain things with you, can't they? My old co-host used to call it the hot to crazy scale, right? The hotter you are, the more crazy you can be. That is the way life works. That is the way sports works. Again, this is just another example of it. The Brooklyn Nets are going to give Ime Udoka another chance. The Brooklyn Nets are going to enable Ime Udoka because he's a good basketball coach, just like they are enabling Kyrie Irving because he's a good basketball player. This is how it is. Okay, Kyrie Irving's under fire for posting a link to an anti-Semitic movie. Do you remember the name Myers Leonard? Now, Myers Leonard, Myers Leonard, excuse me, was a very average big man in the NBA. He actually used an anti-Semitic word on a video game live stream. He was fined. He was suspended by the league. He was released and you never heard from him again. He wasn't good enough to be that big a problem. They, the league and the teams made an example of him because he wasn't good enough. Kyrie Irving doesn't get that same example made. Why? Because he is good enough. And that is the way life works. And it's how life is working here for Ime Udoka. Kyrie gets chances. 
Emei gets chances. Why did Antonio Brown get 100 chances? Why did Josh Gordon get 100 chances? Dante Stallworth killed someone in a drunk driving incident, I believe, and got chances. Why? Because all these teams thought that they that these players could help, so they bring them in. When a guy doesn't have talent, he doesn't get another chance. Ime Odoka has a coaching challenge, a coaching talent, and he gets another chance because of how good he is perceived to be. And the whole thing sickens me, to be perfectly honest with you. I am not saying that Ime Odoka doesn't deserve ever a second chance, but to deserve a second chance this quickly, it is wrong. And it is just, it just reeks of desperation from the Brooklyn Nets, as Freddie Coleman told us. Desperate teams do desperate things, and the Brooklyn Nets are desperate. So, therefore, they are pulling out all the stops, and they don't care how much they have to sell their soul to be able to do it. It is one thing to hire a rehabbed Ime Odoka. If Ime Odoka took the year off, or took two years off, and fixed his personal life, and we saw him speaking at women's conferences, and we saw him speaking to men about how to treat women, and I believe that he had learned something, and he worked with sexual, sexual harassment advocates, that then you want to rehire him? That would be one thing. Ime Odoka, this has been less than two months since he was suspended by the Celtics. I, what could he have learned? What could he have bettered in two months? Probably nothing. Instead, he's just being enabled. We don't have to like it. We don't have to support it. But it is the way the world works. And it's unfortunate. And it will always work this way. And there's nothing that you or I can do about it. Okay? I I do not know as much about pop culture as maybe I should. But I got to imagine that Kanye West was problematic for a long time. He could get away with a lot because he was Kanye. He finally found something now that he can't outrun. Antonio Brown last year finally found a situation he couldn't outrun. So there is a limit to the hot to crazy scale. How good you are dictates how big a distraction or problem you can be. At some point, you're no longer worth your trouble. Ime Odoka apparently is not at that point right now. It's the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV, AM and FM, WDEVradio.com. Uh, you are spot on. I'm going through it now. It is awful. I assume that this texture is referring to the movie that Kyrie was posting about. Rather, not Kyrie posted a link to a movie. He did not did not put any words out about it. He didn't say anything about it. He just said on social media, he just posted the link to the movie. And then he didn't apologize for it in the press conference. He said there's a lot of people behind him who feel just like him. So he's getting grief for that. But that is the, that is the way life works. Nick Wright did a great job today. I was watching a little bit of him. The last six years, Kyrie Irving has torpedoed whatever franchise he's been in. Six consecutive years. He goes to Cleveland, and or he's with Cleveland, rather, his last year. And he asked for a trade, despite the Cavs being Eastern Conference, uh, Eastern Conference favorites. Okay. Goes to Boston. And he was fairly good his first year. Then he got hurt in the playoffs. And they got to the Eastern Conference Finals without him. So that is more of a injury. That's not so much a Kyrie torpedoing. But then he torpedoed the Celtics the last year. He's calling out the young players. He's not getting along with Terry Rozier and all this and all that. So that's a problem. Then he wants out of Boston, despite saying he wanted to stay. Then he goes to Brooklyn, and he was hurt, and Durant was hurt. And he skips the bubble entirely. He won't come back for the bubble. Then last year is last. I mean, like this is this is just Kyrie. It's just too much. But he keeps getting chances, and Ime Odoka is getting chances as well. Um, all right, I'm going to take a very quick break. I'm going to come back tell you about some of my conversation with Tom Karen of Nesson today. We'll get you ready for the World Series, which is coming up about 15 minutes from now. That's next on the Brady Farkas Show on DEV. 
I'm Mike Pichak, and I'm running to be Vermont's next state treasurer. Having served in the cabinet for both a Democrat and a Republican governor, I know how to work across party lines to get things done for Vermont. I also help lead Vermont's COVID-19 response, and now I'm running for state treasurer to help build a strong financial foundation for our state and our families. I'm honored to have the support of our current treasurer, Beth Pierce. I'm Mike Pichak, and I'm asking for your vote in the November 8th general election. Paid for by Mike for Vermont, Molly Stoner Treasurer. Do you want to learn more about the free market perspective on important public policy issues affecting you, your work, and your community? I'm Bill Sayre, and I hope you'll do so by joining me in conversation with Vermont opinion leaders as we discuss how best to make Vermont an ever better and more affordable place to live and work. Common Sense Radio with Bill Sayre. Weekdays, 11 till noon. New England Municipal Resource Center, NEMRIC, proudly supporting local government, local businesses, and WDEV. I'm State Senator Mark McDonald, and I'm running for re-election for Orange County's single seat in the State Senate. I spend months every year talking to my constituents at their front doors, kitchen tables, or at the supermarket or other community meetings. I learn the issues they're most concerned about so I can better represent them. I'm a firm believer in meeting people on their own territory and taking whatever I learn back with me to the State House. Election Day is coming up Tuesday, November 8th. I'd be grateful for your vote, both ready and eager to represent you again in Montpelier. Paid for by Mark McDonald for State Senate. Treasurer Rebecca Ramos. Progressive Snapshot can save you money based on how you drive and how much you drive. So the safer you drive, the more money you could save. Now, if you didn't hear that because you were looking at your phone while driving, let me say it again. Seriously, put down your phone. That is so unsafe. If you didn't do stuff like use your phone while driving, you could save money with Progressive Snapshot. But saving or not, just put it down. <clears throat> and if you did hear it the first time because you weren't looking at your phone, nice work. You'd love Snapshot from Progressive because it rewards safe drivers. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Snapshot not available in California and North Carolina or from all agents. Today on Hey Culligan, reverse to reduce. Here's Bob. Hey Culligan, I love fresh water, but I got plastic bottles coming out. Whoa, there. Bob, you are not kidding about the bottles. But did you know Culligan's reverse osmosis and always-on drinking water systems provide fresh, clean, delicious drinking water and help reduce the equivalent of over 15 billion plastic bottles from landfills worldwide? Holy fresh, environmentally friendly drinking water. Am I right? Right, Bob. And we're already on the way. Let us help you out with a free in-home water test from a local Culligan water expert at Culligan.com. For some people, all they need to know about weather is the high temperature for the day. But if you're one of those people who really wants to understand the hows and whys of weather, especially here in the Green Mountain State, then Roger Hill's Weather Classroom podcast is for you. Some of the topics I'll explore are the types of precipitation, global temperature averages, and tropical cyclones. Roger Hill's Weather Classroom podcast is available at WDEVradio.com, Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music. Make your opinion heard by texting onto the Brady Parker Show at 802 585 3026. This is Field Yates of ESPN, and you're listening to the Brady Farkas Show on WDEV Radio and the WDEV app. Brady Farkas Show back at it here on WDEV AM and FM and WDEVradio.com. World Series coverage for us begins in 10 minutes. Game four of the World Series being played tonight between the Phillies and the Astros. That game from Citizens Bank Park in Philadelphia, where yesterday the Phillies won it, winning 7 nothing. They're two wins away from their first World Series title since 2008. I'm going to talk about one thing with the Red Sox real quick, but I, I got to get this off my chest. If I were Lance McCullers, I would sue the Houston Astros for malpractice. And you know what? I'm really not even joking. And I don't mean that they left him in yesterday to get rocked. That That's their prerogative. Yes, they should have taken him out earlier. No, they didn't. I could care less. That is their prerogative, baseball-wise. I hate the way that Lance McCullers pitches. Absolutely hate it. Buster Olney had the stat yesterday. Now, this was yesterday, I think, right after McCullers came out. Or maybe it was right before McCullers came out. But nonetheless... This was the stat from Buster. Let me find this again. Okay. Lance McCullers has thrown 109 pitches to left-handed batters this postseason and has thrown two fastballs. Two fastballs. 
He's throwing sliders. He's throwing curveballs. He's throwing change-ups. Lance McCullers throws 95 miles an hour, and the Astros will not let him throw his fastball. And you know what? I normally wouldn't care. Like, how you want to pitch is how you want to pitch. But Lance McCullers has had massive arm problems, and in my mind, what the Astros are doing to him is abuse. Maybe he's okay with it, and if he is, then I'll drop this. But Lance McCullers missed the entirety of the 2019 season with an arm problem. Missed most of this year with an arm problem. And he still is out there only throwing breaking balls and only throwing change-ups, things that put an immense amount of stress on your arm. Like, whatever junk ball pitcher you think of, they throw more fastballs than Lance McCullers does. Jamie Moyer threw more fastballs. Rich Hill throws more fastballs. Lance McCullers throws 95 miles an hour, and they will not let him throw fastballs. Two left-handed batters. I, I just, I, I hate watching McCullers pitch. It's out of frustration, really, that I hate watching him pitch because all he does is flip breaking balls, and they are hard to hit. He is good. But now, like, I'm wondering how much of the way he pitches is attributed to how, or rather, how much of his injuries are attributed just to the way he pitches. And I'm sick for him that his organization doesn't seem to value his arm. I mean, 109 pitches to left-handed batters and two fastballs? Like, I'm going to ask Buster about that tomorrow. May, I'm kind of saying it tongue-in-cheek about suing the Astros for medical malpractice. I'm not being that far off. This, to me, is gross. And again, if he signs off on it and he approves of it, then, then I will be mad at him for helping create his own downfall. But he has missed all of 2019 with Tommy John. He missed most of 2022 with arm problems. They, these two things have to be correlated. They have to be correlated. And I hate seeing a guy abused by his organization. And that is exactly what it feels like is happening. Exactly what it feels like is happening. I've got a bunch of stuff with Tom Karen that I spoke about today uh, with him. I said I'm going to get to the Red Sox. I'm going to have to do that tomorrow because I also talked with TC about the Bruins. And I, I promised people I'd give some Bruins love. Bruins won it yesterday. A great 5-2 comeback to win it 6-5. In overtime, Hampus Lindholm with the game winner there. Cur, uh, sorry, uh, Curran, Tom Karen rather was talking with me earlier about how good the bees are and their hot start with their nine and one. It's really remarkable. I mean, the best start in franchise history. They've been playing since 1925. And they're averaging over four goals a game, uh, by far the most in the National Hockey League right now. They give up some goals, like we saw last night. No doubt about that. But, you know, their offense right now is kind of what we're talking about with baseball and power. They've got that quick strike capability. Yeah, the Bruins, I mean, six goals, like, that's pretty good. Now, again, they gave up five, and the goaltending yesterday wasn't great. And uh, Olmark was bad, and he was pulled, and Swayman was in, and he got hurt, and then Olmark came back and was good at the end. But, you know, so the, the defense, when they would get McAvoy back, they're going to be better defensively overall, but uh, they are able to score. And for a team, and again, we just thought we were going to have to tread water for a while. Like, that is, you know, they're 9-1. and one. They have the best record in the NHL. That's not just treading water. Uh, Texter says Tim Wakefield threw more fastballs than McCullers. Dane in Rochester says, I just tuned in. Sorry, what was the tip that McCullers was giving last night? Was it his leg kick or the shake he was doing with his plant leg? I don't know officially. We can talk with Buster about that, too. Buster said that there was no tip. It was just the Phillies had a great game plan because they know that he's not going to throw fastballs, especially the lefties, and I think that's very true. You look at the homers yesterday. Harper had one. Marsh had one. Schwarber had one. They're all lefties there. So I think there's, you know, I think game plan is certainly part of it. If there was a tip, I, usually these things are attributable to hand positioning, right? You hold your hands a little closer to the body on this pitch, so down a little further here, up a little further there. I've got the mute button on here on ESPN. They were just talking about it. It looked like maybe it was hand positioning, but don't don't quote me on that. I wasn't paying. I got home late last night from the basketball game, hurt my ankle, had to do a lot of stuff to get ready, so I didn't catch the game until it was out of hand, really. So I, I wasn't watching super intently at the beginning because I was not home at the, at the beginning and the game was such a blowout. It wasn't really worth going back and watching over again. Usually the, the tips and tells 
are from hand positioning. World Series Game 4 is coming up next here on the stations of Radio Vermont. Astros looking to hold serve. Well, looking to even serve, rather, I should say. Phillies looking to hold serve and take another two-game lead in this series. It's going to be Aaron Nola against Christian Javier. Javier strikes out a lot of batters. We'll see what happens today. Buster only tomorrow on the Ready Farkas Show. We're back at it. Go download the podcast, everybody. At Northfield Savings Bank, we celebrate the ways you work and why you work. 